morning, Journey. How are we doing? It is good to see everybody. Hopefully all the dads had a happy Father's Day last week and everybody laughed at your jokes and you ate whatever you wanted. That's my prayer. I want to welcome everybody joining us online as well as our Lake County campus. We are in a series called Analog Christian where if you've not been a part of any of this series or maybe you're new, I just want to welcome you. I'm going to catch you up. Basically what we're doing is we're looking at this series all summer long. How do we follow Jesus in a fast pace? digital world. And so if you're new or newer, just honored that you're here with us at Journey Christian Church. Know that we've been praying for you and continue to do so. Our prayer is that God would allow uh, or that you would experience God in a fresh new way. And so we're excited about that. This series comes from Galatians 5, 22 and 23. It says this, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Last week, we went a little bit out of order. Last week, we talked about patience. Today, we're going to talk about peace. And some of y'all were a little, that made you shake a little bit. So you had to work on patience so that we get to peace. You know what I'm saying? So I want to ask you some questions, and I need you to respond if you know the answer, but I want you to respond with your outdoor voice, not your quiet, shy, indoor voice. So we're just going to practice one time. Everybody say, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, y'all are good. Y'all are good. Y'all are ready. So Lake County Online, uh, I just want you to do this. And anytime I say online, I'm just picturing somebody uh, listening in the gym on a treadmill, and they're just going to randomly shout. And that's okay. I get excited about that. All right, so fill in the blank. I'm going to start a sentence. You finish it. I'm ready to throw in the towel. Yeah. I'm at the end of my My life is falling I'm at my wits. I'm so frustrated I could pull my hair. All right. Okay, so I got some good news and some bad news. The bad news is apparently we are experts at stress. Okay? Like, like y'all really, really knew that. The good news is, is, is our God is an expert at peace. Amen? And that's what we're going to talk about today. I don't know if you heard this story in 2009. There was a teenager in New York City, and she was walking and texting, and TikToking, or whatever she was doing on her phone, uh, until she fell into a manhole. I mean, it was marked, it was, it was, it was everything, all the signs were around it, but she was just glued to her phone until she was in, in the sewers with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Like, that's what... And somebody referred to this as being a digital zombie, which is a state of being more absorbed in the distractions of the digital world than the reality of the physical world. And God warns us of this, not so much digital, but just going with the flow. And he says this in Romans 12 too, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And so it's so easy to just go with the flow in the digital age. I don't know about you, but it's just so easy. And not just my phone. I can go from my phone to my house to watch Netflix. And and then from Netflix to to ordering something on Amazon. I mean, I I just live online. And just all of a sudden, spiritually, I just fall into a manhole. I don't know about you. And I don't want to be a spiritual zombie. We're talking about digital zombie. I don't want to be a spiritual zombie. So we're talking about Luke chapter 10 today, Luke 10, 38 through 42. If you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible in the seat back in front of you. I want to give that to you uh, from journey to you. If you don't have a Bible at all, you could uh, take that home with you. That's a gift from us to you on the inside cover is some tools, some resources on how to read the Bible. And listen, it's not stealing. It's a gift. So you don't have to like put it in your pants or anything. Like just take it. It's a gift from us to you. Okay. It's okay. So we are in Luke 10, 38 through 42, if you were using one of the Bibles and see back in front of you, it's 892, page 892, and this is where we're at. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha, what's her name? Martha. Martha. Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary. What's her name? Mary. Mary. Y'all are on fire. (laughs) Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You're 
worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better and will not be taken away from her. You see, I, I think Mary, I, I just have a, a theory. I think Mary was probably the youngest sibling. You see, there were three siblings. So it was Mary, Martha, and then Lazarus. Lazarus was related. This is the person that Jesus rose from the dead. So all three of them, I think Mary was the sibling. And I think Martha, just my guess, was the oldest. And the reason I think that is because literally Martha tattles to, to the Lord of the universe. And what does he do? He takes the youngest sibling's side, right? <laughs> Some of y'all younger siblings, you're like, that never happens. And the older people are like, it always happens. <laughs> you can never do any wrong. You see, when we read this story, what we tend to think is that Mary was righteous, like she was the godly one because she was sitting at the feet of Jesus and Martha was the, the evil one, that we should never act like Martha because she was just working while Jesus was in the house. And I think we get this text wrong when we think like that. You see, who was the one that invited Jesus into the home? It was Martha. Martha was the one that had the gift of hospitality. Martha was the one that, invi that saw Jesus, that invited Jesus. And, and this is a reminder of how quickly we can start off seeing Jesus, inviting him into our lives, inviting him into our homes, and yet how quickly we can get distracted of the things of this world. You see, Martha said, Jesus, come into my home. And once Jesus was in the home, it wasn't that it was bad that she was making food or preparing things for Jesus, and we're going to find that out in a minute. That wasn't bad. What was bad is Jesus calls out what was wrong, and that was that she was distracted. You see, Mary was focused while Martha was frustrated. Mar Martha's struggle wasn't working as much as it was being distracted. And here's why. We have a graph for this. You see, Martha was distracted, and her distractions allowed her to take her mind off of Jesus. Once you take your mind off of Jesus, I don't care what you're focused on, it always leads to stress. And once you have stress, you no longer have peace. So when we're talking about peace, what we need to do is go, okay, what distracts me? So the question today is, what is distracting you from taking your eyes off of Jesus? And a lot of times we think, oh, it's the big bad sins. Listen, this wasn't a big bad sin. She was working for Jesus. It wasn't sinful. The sin was that her eyes got off of Jesus. And it's easy for all of us to invite Jesus into our home, start off good, but somewhere we get distracted. And that distraction takes our minds off of Jesus, which adds stress and takes away peace. So let me ask you, where have you taken your eyes off of Jesus? Where have you been distracted? You started off on the right path and your mind has wandered, even if it was good, but it's no longer on Jesus. You see, Mary is at peace while Martha lost hers. You see, we see this story almost exactly unfold a little bit later on. These characters are in the Bible in the New Testament three different times. And the second time is in John 12. And it starts off the same, but I want you to notice there's a big difference. It says this, Jesus came to Bethany. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Almost exact same story, except they have matured a little bit. Did you notice that? So Mary isn't just sitting at the feet of Jesus. Mary now is worshiping at the feet of Jesus. She's, she's uh, giving a, an act of worship. She's got this expensive perfume, perfume she's pouring out. She's sacrificing. She's tithing. She's giving a beautiful sacrifice. She's worshiping. And what is Martha doing? Martha's doing the same thing, but instead of being distracted, she's focused. You see, it wasn't the sin of what she was doing, but how she was doing it. She was no longer distracted. That's why Jesus doesn't rebuke her in John 12. She wasn't rebuked because her heart was focused on Jesus. Both women grew in their roles. So today we're going to talk about peace and, and really everything we know about peace, everything that we can learn about peace comes from the cross. So I'm going to process this through three different things. The way we get peace is by getting right with God, by getting right with others, and by getting right with self. 
The, the way we lose peace is if we're not right with God, if we're not right with others, and we're not right with self. And, and just leave this up for a second, because here's the important thing. Some of you, maybe a lot of us today, you don't have peace, and you're like, man, I just can't figure out why I don't have peace. It's really easy. It's one of these three things. Either you're not right with God, you're not right with others, or you're not right with self. And once you can identify where you're not right, now you can go to ground zero and go, okay, why am I not right with God? What is it? Why, why am I not right with others or why am I not right with myself? So this is always a gauge that we could circle back and go, okay, where is the lack of peace in my life and how can I solve that? So let's start off with the first one, getting right with God, right with God. That's our vertical relationship. I, I'm here, God's there. This is my vertical. I need to get right with God. You see, our peace starts and ends with God. The Bible is uh, an incredible book, and, and so many times we look at the Bible and we think, man, God's just telling us to do all these things because he wants us to do whatever he wants us to do. I don't quite understand it, but he's just a legalistic God, and here's the truth. The Bible is an incredible book because everything in it is geared to making your life better. Did you know that? Like, when you obey the Bible, you will get more peace. It's not that he's just trying to rule you. It's like when we obey him, we get more peace. It's a, it's a manual for peace. So I need to get right with God. There's a couple ways that we get right with God. Here's one solution to getting right with God is confess known sin. What sin do you have in your life that you've not confessed? Anytime I have sin, anytime we have sin, I cannot stand peacefully before a perfect and holy God. I can't. And this is why so many of us are tempted not to read the Bible. This is why so many of us are tempted not to show up at church. Because we did something on Tuesday, God's here, we did something, and now it's unconfessed. And so now I, I feel guilty, I feel shame, I can't go before God. But the moment that I confess it, I'm in right standing with him and I feel comfortable. But the problem is we constantly are thinking about what we did on Tuesday. We don't confess that so we don't experience peace. And so we avoid Sunday because we know we're going to be confronted with that sin. And it goes from one Sunday to a month to three years to five years to ten years before we've been back in church. Why? Because we didn't confess that sin. And so what God's saying to get right with him, to get peace with him, is just confess known sin. And the word known sin is just for you. He already knows it. Like he already knows everything. Confess known sin. This is what Acts 3.19 says. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Okay, so this is what happens when you confess, because we have this mixed idea of what happens when we confess. A lot of times we think, man, if I confess, God's just going to destroy me. No, this is what he's going to do. He's going to destroy your sin, and he's going to give you times of refreshing. What is that? That's peace. That's what happens when we confess our sin. He gives us times of refreshing. He's not trying to shame you. He's trying to refresh you. The second way that we get right with God. The first is to confess known sin. The second is to receive God's forgiveness. Did you know that guilt is the number one destroyer of peace? Do you know that? Guilt is the number one destroyer of peace. So what we do is we come in and we confess known sin. We get right with God. And some of us are really good at that. And we're really poor at receiving God's forgiveness. I know that because I talked to so many of you and you're still broken up what you did 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 weeks ago. And I'll ask you, did you, did you repent? And you say, absolutely. I've done it like 100 times. And what you've done after you repented is you stiffed-armed the grace of God. You said, God, I'm going to repent, but there's no way I can receive your grace. And so what you're living in is guilt and shame, and you can't live in that forever. Eventually, you begin to, to move away from God because God's trying to wrap his arms of grace around you, and you just don't want it. And so I'd say today, receive the gift of grace that God has for you. Amen. For, allow God's grace. That was the whole point of the cross. Some of you are, are thinking of what you did a while ago. Maybe it was a, a divorce. Maybe you did some time. Maybe you made some horrible parenting decisions. Maybe you did something wrong in what you said or what you did. And listen, we've all been there. That's what Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's one of the things I love about journey is, is you're good. We're not perfect, but you're good at taking your mask off. And when you and I take our mask off, God says, great, now I, now I can do business with you. But the more we take our mask on, 
makes it difficult. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We went to, took some students to camp not long ago and there was one student named Bella Grace that's had an encounter with Jesus the past six months and a leader saw this and noticed this and Bella Grace wrote this. I wanna read it to you. This is what it says. I've always avoided going to church despite my parents' efforts and spent much of my life seeking the things of this world to fill my spiritual void. I was denying basic biblical truths and turned my back on the Lord. It was only about six months ago that I truly accepted his love and started living for Christ. I'll never regret my decision. God brings so much joy and it's only through him that I have found both my purpose and a lasting peace that surpasses all understanding. Isn't that cool? I love it. You see, she understood not just to confess sin, but to receive God's grace. Church, would you, man, would you please receive God's grace? When you and I don't receive God's grace, we, we make the cross pointless in our life. Do you understand that? Like when we don't receive the grace, there's no need for the cross. And I can't think anything worse than my Savior dying for nothing for you. He died so that you would have grace, so you would have reconciliation, so you would have peace with him. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says this, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Is there anything you need to confess to God today? Is there any sin that you need to receive his forgiveness for? So that's the first way we get peace is by getting right with God. The second way is by getting right with others. So, so here we got vertically, we get right with God and then we get right with others. That's, that's uh, horizontal. This is what Romans 12, 18 says. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If it is possible. My uncle, when he was a teenager, he had a motorcycle which means you're automatically cool when you're a teenager and have a motorcycle, right? So like, I, he had this motorcycle, he would, he would drive it everywhere and, and he had it, he loved it until one day somebody stole his motorcycle. I know, right? Like somebody stole his motorcycle. Never found out who did it, like just bummed. Years go by, as a matter of fact, over 20 years go by. This person looks up, my uncle finds him, asks to meet with him says, hey, Roger, I don't know if you remember this, but when, when we were teenagers, I was the one that stole your motorcycle. And he said, here's, here's the money that I want to repay back. And I just want you to know, I'm sorry. I found Jesus, gave my life to him, and I'm getting right with him, and I need to get right with people. And my uncle said, get that trash out of here, punk. I'm just kidding. <laughs> That'd be awesome. No, no, my, my uncle forgave him. How powerful is that? Like so many times when we wrong other people, we tell him, but we don't tell them. And what God's saying is, listen, I'm glad you told me. That's, but that's step one. Now go tell them. And here's the deal. I was joking about my uncle rejecting that. But the truth is, a lot of people do reject an apology. But, but listen to what Romans says. As far as it depends on you. That, that's your job, is to go and try to reconcile. It's not your job to make sure they forgive you. It's a, you've done everything you can. As long as it depends on you, live at peace. Matthew 5, and 23 says this. If, you're, if, if you are offering your gift at the altar... And there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. So in the middle of worship, if you remember that you're right with God, but you're not right with somebody, what it's saying is leave the service. Leave what you're doing to go get right because getting right is worship. That is, that is an act of a sacrifice to the Lord. And it says, then come back and worship because then you're going to have peace both up and horizontally. 
I don't see anybody leaving. <laughs> That'd be kind of funny if everybody just took off. <laughs> That's what this guy did, right? He's trying to get right with God and he said, I can't get right with God. I'm not right with man. I got to go and got the Holy Spirit just put him on his heart. I got to go fix this. A friend of mine is a pastor in Atlanta. I love, he's got this saying that I love. He says this, be close with a few, connect with many, conflict with none. Not good. Be close with a few, connect with many, conflict with none. It's a great principle. So we get right with God. We get right with others. And then we get right with self. So we get right with God. That's vertical. Horizontal is getting right with others. This right here, this is the sweet spot of peace. This is what we, this is our target. You see, a lot of us, we, we can get right with God. We're right here, but we're not right with others. We're just down here. Some of us are right with others, but we're not right with God. And so we're over here. But right here is the sweet spot. And when you're right with God and you're right with others, third one is you get right with self. I love uh, Southwest Airlines commercials. I don't know if you've ever seen these commercials. The want to get away commercials, you know about them? They're just funny. If you have no idea, the good news is we got a clip. Check this out. Who amongst you goes by the name Fenwick? Tell me, and the rest of you will be spared. I am Fenwick. I am Fenwick. I am Fenwick. Hey, Fenwick, have you seen my shield? This has got vertical stripes on it. Mine had horizontal. Want to get away? <laughs> now you can with Southwest Ferris as low as $59 one way. Yes to low Ferris with nothing to hide. That's transparent. Isn't that good? So listen, I, I, I love the commercials. I, I love it. But the underlying theme, and I'm not knocking them, they, they're doing a great job. But the underlying theme is if you have issues, all you have to do is get away. Like, hey, if, if there's ever anything wrong in your life, all you need is a new destination. But here's the truth. The truth is wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> wherever you go, there you are. So if you don't have peace in Orlando, Florida, you're not going to have peace in Fiji. You're just not. And, and here, listen, a lot of us don't realize that. A lot of us are so stressed. A lot of us are like, man, I just need a vacation. I need a vacation. And yes, that will do something good to your schedule. That will do something good maybe physically, but it won't do anything internally. And so wherever you go, there you are. And so we get right with God. We get right with each other. But there are things that that you're not right with yourself in. And these are not things that are the same for everybody. All of us have something that God's working in us and we know exactly what that is and we know for some of you, it's like, man, God's calling you to wake up a little bit early and spend a little bit more time with him. He's just telling you that. That's not maybe for every single person because not every person is a morning person, but he's telling you that and you're not doing it so you're not right with self. And so wherever you go, you're gonna have this inner turmoil. I love what Rick Warren said. He said this. He says, if you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. But if you look to Christ, you'll be at rest. So here's my prayer. Everybody listening that's on vacation right now, all you that are going to go on vacation, don't just go on vacation and accidentally, I don't think we do this on purpose. We go on vacation and we accidentally leave God at home. And we wonder why we come back and we don't have peace. We feel like we need a vacation from our vacation. Listen, just take God with you. Just maybe it's, it's, it's getting into a book. Maybe it's reading the Bible. Maybe it's just worship. But somehow get right with God when you're on vacation. That way you're taking care of the, the body, mind, and soul when you come back fully rested, fully at peace. I don't know if you've ever heard of the app Flappy Birds. Anybody ever hear of Flappy Birds? Okay, four of you. Great. Okay. <laughs> this is going to land perfectly. Okay. This is an app. Now everybody's heard of Flappy Birds. Literally, this scene is everything you need to know about Flappy Birds. This is the entire app. This is, it's just pipes on the bottom and on the top, and this bird just has to go through the pipes. The way that you make the bird go up is you press a button. There's only one button on the app. You just press a button, and it goes up. If you don't press the button, it just goes down. You see, this app was invented in 2013 by a guy named Dong Nguyen in the Philippines. 
He was in his mid to late 20s. He loved video games, and he wanted to build a game that he could just play for himself when he was on the go. He was just always on the go. He just wanted to build a game, never thought about it being worldwide or anything like that. And for the first eight months that he created it, it was basically just him and his parents, and that's all that knew about it. And then somehow someone found out about it and began to spread. After eight months, it went viral. 50 million downloads. You don't seem impressed. Okay, let me explain it. Okay. <laughs> he was making $50,000 a day. Yeah, I got you. I got you. Yeah. Some of you are Googling right now how to code video games. <laughs> and then he started getting some feedback from around the world. It was trickling to him. You see, he never went out to try to be some big app maker. He was just trying to do something. He's a very simple lifestyle, lived with his parents, very humble life. And then he started hearing about some of the reviews. One woman wrote that it's distracting the children of the world. Like literally every child in the world is distracted by your app. That's a little bit much, but she wrote it anyways. <laughs> Another one laments that 13 kids at my school broke their phones because of your game. And they still play it because it's addicting like crack. That's Larry the quote. <laughs> he went on to say, at first I thought they were joking, but then I realized I was really, they were really hurting themselves. He says he know this because when he was in high school, he failed a lot of tests because he was so involved in video games. A game he calls Counter-Strike took up most of his time. And so in 2014, not long after the app was invented, he did something that nobody saw coming. He pulled the app from the app store and walked away. $50,000 a day. Gone. Just like that. Nobody expected that. He was interviewed a little bit after that. And this is what he said. He responded when somebody said, why would you ever do that? He said, I am the master of my own fate. You see, listen, was creating Flappy Birds a sin? No, it wasn't a sin. He just wasn't right with himself. He didn't have a peace with himself. And listen, we are not the masters of our own fate. As Christians, we, we have a sovereign God. But you and I do have decisions that we make every single day that can either add peace or take away peace from our life. And we, in, we are in control of that. And I love that. I want to close with a story about a rich man. He wanted peace in his life. Not only did he want peace in his life, he, he wanted peace in his home. And so he hired three really well-known artists. And he said, hey, I want you to come into my home. I want you to paint a, a picture, a beautiful painting that would depict peace for my home. I want to come home and feel peace. And so he said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take a month, get away, and then come back. And I want you to show me your, your painting." So after a month, the first person came in and unveiled the painting. It was of a beautiful mountain scene. The mountain was covered with green aspen trees and beautiful wildflowers. The snow-capped mountains majestically met the breathtaking clear blue cloudless sky. The rich man said, I like it. This is a very peaceful painting. And then a second, second artist came in, unveiled it, and it was a beautiful ocean scene. <clears throat> The sand was crystal white. The sea was blue and tranquil. The sun was slowly setting in the sky and its reflection danced across the calm sea. And the center of the painting were two people relaxing in a lawn chair as the, at the water's edge with their feet calmly resting in the sea. The rich man said, wow, I love the beach. This is very, very peaceful painting. Then the third artist is now hesitant to unveil his. He finally unveils it and immediately the rich man looked puzzled and he stared at the painting. The artist painted a waterfall scene. In this painting, a raging river is falling hundreds of feet, crashing on rocks below. The rich man said, how is this peaceful? I've stood beside a waterfall and it's anything but peaceful. The sound of the water is deafening and I can see all the turbulence. Where is the peace? Then the artist said, look closer. So the rich man leaned in. He said, notice in the waterfall that I, I, I painted, uh, I, I painted it from the side. And if you look closer, there's, there's a little rock underneath the waterfall. 
He said, yeah, yeah, I, I see it. He said, underneath that rock is a little bird. He said, that's peace. He said, in the midst of a violent, crashing down waterfall with turbulence, he said, this is you. You can be in the midst of that and experience God's peace. And the man said, that's the peace I want. How can I have that peace? You see, peace isn't the absence of troubles. We're gonna have trouble in this life. Jesus said that. What peace is, is the confidence of knowing that he's gonna carry you each and every step of the way. And he does that through the cross. When we get right with him, we get right with each other, we get right with ourselves. Romans 5.1 says this, therefore, since we've been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. That's how we get peace. We get peace because of the cross. So I don't know where you're at today. I don't know if you need to get right with God. I would say do it. I don't know if you need to get right with someone else. I would say do it. Maybe you need to get right with yourself and just be kind to yourself. Maybe you need to give yourself the grace that you're so quick to give everybody else. If that's the case, then do it. Let me pray for you. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, God, thank you. I thank you for the, the peace that you offer in the midst of a violent waterfall. God, I, I just know there's someone in Lake County, there's someone online, someone in Apopka, when they hear about a, a painting of a waterfall, they don't feel right now like they're underneath it safe, underneath a rock. They feel like they're in the midst of going over that waterfall and, and they're scared, they're anxious. And, and to be honest, God, they don't feel you. I just pray for that person right now in the name of Jesus, would you bring them peace? Would you snatch them from the waterfall and you put them underneath the rock? God, whoever they are, Whatever they're going through, would you give them peace? The peace that you talk about that doesn't make any sense, passes all understanding, doesn't make sense to us, give them that peace. And would you help us to get right with you? Would you give us the courage to get right with others? Would you help us to get right with ourselves? And God, we thank you for the gift of peace. We thank you for the gift of the cross. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.